Okay, I see uh, the president's here, so I'm going to call the meeting to order and turn it over to President Serco for the work session. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, sorry, did I miss it? Did, did Matt give provide his disclaimer? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't believe I forgot that. Mr. Town Manager, can you please give the protocol and the disclaimer? Sure. Uh, just a reminder to everybody that this meeting is being recorded, as you heard. Um, uh, typically, in the work session, the council, the, the work sessions are structured so that the council uh, uses this opportunity to discuss amongst themselves. If you uh, if you'd like to to send a note or uh, folks are folks are basically uh, more than welcome to connect with me using the chat function. Um, and I, I, as you can see, we're testing out our new hybrid model. So please do bear with us if we have any technical difficulties. But um, if for some reason uh, we have an error that makes it so we're not able to continue, we'll We'll end the meeting and we'll, we'll send out a new link for, for folks to rejoin this evening. But um, with that, uh, and, back and, to and also we we uh, like we would like to request anyone who isn't on the council or the staff to please block their video. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you and sir. now, Mr. President. All right. Good evening, everyone. I see we have all the council members here, with the exception of. Uh, Kabir and he indicated he wouldn't be able to make it this evening. So we'll proceed without him. And you appear frozen, Mr. Mayor. I don't know. Uh oh. I think Steve is I think Steve is frozen. Are you all able to? I hope it's not on our end. I can I can hear you okay. Can you hear Steve? Folks hear me? No, okay? Now we can hear you. Now I can hear you. I don't know what happened there, sorry. Uh, the first item on the agenda is Jaren. Freezing again. I guess he's checking, so. Um, well, I'll just read from the notes. Mayor Slavin and I have been working with two town residents uh, about the town reconvening for a non-engineering party. The party was an annual tradition in town that was postponed during COVID because of lingering COVID concerns that plans to hold the party at the town pool on Thursday, September 1. In the past, it has been a simple party celebrating those who've lived in Somerset for a long time and in many cases seen major changes. The only expenses for the town are for name tags and ice cream. If there are no objections, then no council action is required. Right, and we just put it on the agenda so everybody would know about it. And we, we greatly appreciate the residents yeah. who are um, hosting. Right, and I, I don't, do any uh, council members have questions or concerns? No, just what's the date of it again, please? Thursday, September 1st. At two o'clock. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll consider that uh, a non-issue. Please proceed, Matt, with that. And then uh, the update on code enforcement officer. I think this would also be an update from you, Matt. Yep, uh, so I, um, I included sort of the uh, basic summary for you all. Um, I think the... The way that we had talked about proceeding was to essentially cast as wide a net as possible and advertise both the job as a as a part time, uh, possibly contracted position, as we had done um, when Wayne was working with the town, but also as a full time uh, a full time or more than a part time staff position at least. Um, to have a, a more regular presence in the office and in the town. And so drafted two um, 
two position descriptions. I've shared them with uh, Doug as well, who, who's with us um, and is here to answer questions if we want to bring him into this conversation now. And I've also shared with the Public Safety Committee Chair, uh, Kumar Baswani. Um, and so I think the idea is that between, between us, we'll, we'll fine tune it and post, post that position according to our uh, procurement policy and have somebody, uh, somebody in place this fall so that we can start having more regular code enforcement, uh, public safety uh, uh, presence in town moving forward. Um, so I, I, I think I attached for you the position descriptions as well. Um, if, if anybody wants to give some feedback on them or some things that maybe we're missing or, um, but again, same thing uh, as the last item that uh, I, don't, I don't think any formal action is needed on the council's part, but I wanted to make sure that we gave an update and Kumar, Doug, and I are all here to answer questions and also to, to take any feedback you might have. Um, th thank you very much, Matt. Can you give any insights into what uh, the Village of uh, Martin's Editions lessons learned were? Well, yeah, this was part of the reason why I thought that even though our it would require some kind of reshuffling of some of our resources in the budget, that it was worth advertising the position for full time. Um, and then depending on who, who applied, you know, somebody might be available 30 hours a week as opposed to 40, but instead of only limiting ourselves to a, a part-time contracted position because, and, and Doug, Doug was there for that. So Doug, you might have something to add as well, but I think, Essentially, what happened in Martin's editions is they they went out to bid on this and he limited themselves to the same structure that was existing, and essentially got I think maybe three people three people that applied for it, um, two of whom had essentially zero experience in this, and then the third person was waiting, and so. Um, that's, that was sort of why I, I thought that it might be prudent to uh, go in with sort of an open mind about how we might structure it, fit it into the budget instead of strictly going, um, saying we got X number of dollars on this budget line, so that's all we can do. That's great, thank you. Yeah, I, I completely uh, support the idea of pursuing two paths to give us hopefully uh, to generate greater interest and options for us to consider. Um, I'm also thinking about what are some um, recruiting options? Like, can we reach out to Montgomery College? Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't really know any, can't think of anything else, but it would seem yeah. to me that there might be some places we can more actively try to seek applicants. I think that that's that's a great idea. Um, so if any if anybody has some extra extra places where it might behoove us to to reach out and try to get pools of candidates from from there, um, certainly open to that in all ears. Okay. Um, the only thought I want to share with 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 you and my fellow council members before we go around the, the virtual table is is the title of this position. Um, I guess I think the code enforcement officer sort of sounds like um, somebody's just going to be checking for parking tickets sort of thing. And, and I think actually we're looking for more than that. And I think it might make the job sound more interesting if, if we call it, say, the public safety officer. And, and an example would be we don't have a code on condition of sidewalks, 
but we sure want somebody to be looking at the sidewalks all around town and letting us know if we need to replace some sidewalks or repair some sidewalks for public safety. Anyhow, uh, those are some thoughts. Um, let's go around. Shannon, do you have uh, any thoughts, perspective on this? I agree with you in terms of like, uh, you know, maybe perhaps like a different title. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's kind of ever evolving with, um, you know, all that we're learning with the public safety officers that we have as well. So kind of keeping that fluidity um, in mind for this position, because it could look different, you know, in a month or so versus where it sits now. And, you know, just kind of, you know, making sure that we're we're looking for kind of the right the right things and kind of an all encompassing person, just given the fact like what if we don't have, you know, a public safety officer um, or a police, you know, if, if we don't have the police presence kind of anymore in our town, what that also would bring to the to this position. Right. OK. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Debbie. Um, I agree with both of you. I think calling it a code enforcement officer is way too limiting to what this job is. As I read through the, um, the uh, uh, you know, the job description, I mean, this person's going to do a lot <laughs> and uh, it's much more than code enforcement. It's more all around. It'd be great if we can maybe brainstorm, maybe we don't have to do it right now, but brainstorm a, a better title. And I also think we should advertise it at, at um, at, at, at um, University of Maryland, because yes. put, put it in their job bank, because hopefully, you know, what happens to them, to their career offices, they get a lot of, of kids coming back looking for jobs, not only their own, not only graduates presently, but uh, past. So I think it'd be a great job for a kid who is maybe doing civil engineering or something. Maybe I'm really wrong about that, but, but, but I think I, I, I'm really excited about it. Um, I can't believe they can do all that we've asked on this job job thing, but I think it's great. It's a great start. And and just tell me, my understanding is right that we are advertising for both the job and a consultant. Is that did I read that right in terms of the two different job descriptions? I think so because we're not sure what we'll get. Okay. In terms of applicants. All right, that just took me a minute. All right, thank you. All right. So correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but we don't intend to fill both positions as described it's sort of an either or but we want to see what we get exactly exactly that's exactly okay uh robin yeah um actually i was thinking maybe the way you've described it as just as deputy town manager would be the appropriate title for it frankly um but one of the questions i had was um you actually talk about this individual as directing town staff in building, you know, re review of planning for, um, do you really mean that? Because it would be directing you, <laughs> you know? is that, is that the way around you want it? Yeah, actually, uh, Doug, Doug and I were talking about that this morning. So I think uh, that language does need to be massaged and, and worked out a little bit. Um, okay. We, we 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 sort of had the same 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 ideas, same thoughts. All right, all right. Okay. Great discussion. Thank you for your inputs. Does that help you, Matt? Do you have any further questions of the council? Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. And I will um I'll make sure that I'll I'll, I'll just touch back in. Um I'll I'll make some edits based on some of the conversations I had with Doug and Make sure that I have an open line of communication with, with uh, Mr. Gaswani, and then we can move forward. And I can give you all an update on uh, when, when once it's finally posted and where we're posting it. And uh, if you have any additional ideas throughout the process, um, it's perfect. Great. Um, the third agenda item is the town tree code. Can you give us an, an update here, Matt? Yeah. Um, so this was not necessarily a uh, something that any action was needed. I just 
felt like this code has been in place. I think I think we adopted it in February, so it's been in effect for four or five months. And I just wanted to sort of take a couple moments to talk through how it's worked in practice um, and just make sure that it's functioning as intended um, in, in case we needed to tweak it or since it's, it's kind of a continual process. And the things that I, I wanted to highlight is that so far the experience has been that when we're getting a request for, uh, for you know, one tree, even in these instances where it, it's above a certain size, it's usually the case, and in fact, it's, it's only been the case so far, that people are requesting to remove those trees if there's something wrong with the tree, if it's hazardous or dead or dying. And we, we, did, a, uh, we did put in a provision that allows, that essentially doesn't delay somebody from being able to take that action if there's a true hazard to life or property and to allow for emergency removals um, if, if the town arborist takes a look and agrees that it's an emergency. My only thought though was that part of the reason we put in this trigger, so it would be 24, uh, 24 inches or, or above, re regardless of the number of trees, was that we had a sense that it was beneficial for the town to implement reforestation plans uh, especially to replace these large and mature trees because of all the benefits that they give. And so the only thing that I was pointing out here is that when we're getting these emergency removals, we're not imposing any reforestation plans because the code, the code doesn't allow the mayor or his designee to impose reforestation plans. And um, I just wanted to point that out, let you know how that's working. It, it may not be a problem, but uh, just just thought I would kind of give an update on how that code amendment was functioning at this point. Okay. Um, Robin, do you have any? Yeah, that's right. I, I think I mean Ron could comment on this, but I believe it is the case that in the absence of a permit application, um, we can't require a reforestation plan. Is what it boils down to, but Ron can perhaps clarify that for me. Sure. The, the, the code could be amended to provide that in the event of an emergency removal that the mayor or manager has the authority to compel reforestation. I believe the town of Chevy Chase currently has such a provision on its books. The you know, town manager can approve certain removals and compel reforestation. So as the code's currently written, council member Barr is correct, but we could revise that. And, and, I, and let me just remind everybody, I think that's the direction you all have seemed to be wanting to go as these cases have come up. So I would really recommend that you, you think about that. Maybe you're even ready to have it drafted. Do we have um, a tree reforestation plan for the town trees? Yeah, uh, uh, maybe Tolbert can speak to this at a future meeting, but in general, essentially what he does is whenever a town tree is removed, and this doesn't, this doesn't necessarily apply to the parkland trees, but our street, street trees, town street trees, when one of them is removed, essentially he plant, he replants something there in the, in the next site. Um, well, well, there is there is a policy that was passed some time ago. I think Councilor Barr probably remembers that. I, sorry, I was thinking of something else there, so I need to because remember there was the whole. I think before you were on the council, remember the. Years ago, the town had that monoculture, that oh, monoculture yeah. plan, and that, that, that was yeah. changed because it was outdated and they worked with the arborists. So 
Yes, we do have, but I think there's, especially coming from the Environment Committee, there's been grave concern for the loss of the tree canopy with all the development in the town. So, I, and right now we have no tools in certain situations to require anybody to replace. And I, and I think this is something that you all have been committed to. Yeah, right. I mean, let, let me just put a, a small counter from personal experience on this, which is that we in fact had a very large 42 inch trunk oak tree that we had to take down because it was threatening a neighbor's house, it was dying. And uh, at the time, um, it was suggested that, why don't we plant another tree there? And I, I looked at it and I noticed that in fact, another oak had already started to grow at another point, in the same general area. And I said, okay, I'll just let that other oak grow and that, that will cover it and that was good. But then later on, I said, why don't I just let the area become a copse? Because in fact, lots of, it is a naturally wooded area and therefore the most likely uh, growth there are trees. And that was 10 or 15 years ago and it is now a copse and there are multiple trees there. I'm actually gonna to have to remove some of the trees because we're interfering with the growth of other trees, um, but it is very clearly advancing. So it isn't necessarily you know, a deliberate reforestation plan. We want people to recognize that the area will grow trees if you let it grow trees. That's, that's really what it's about. Um, this is a separate yep. like thing, but I feel like kind of in the whole guise of this, which is that, um, you know, as we're like kind of re-looking at perhaps changing the code or whatnot, like it would be nice to have um, the tree parts go under the not or under the consent agenda for town council meetings instead of the um, non-consent agenda because, you know, I think that we came up once where we said that, you know, I'm not going to tell, say like, if Dr. Tolbert recommends to take down a tree, I'm not going to say like, oh, let's not take down that tree. Um, you know, and so I don't, it just seems to kind of be a little bit of a time waste on some of the, um, town council meetings, in my opinion. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Shannon. Um, yes, and, and the, the proposal here is to, I guess, amend our code to allow the town, the, the, the mayor to um, administer some tree reforestation requirements in the case of removal of hazardous trees. So I'm interpreting your feedback as saying that would probably be a sensible modification. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be a requirement because it can be on a case by case basis. But right now we have no tools at all. And I would certainly suggest that you that you put in the in the code that it's the staff or mayor under the advice, you know, as advised by by uh, the town arborist or, or some professional. I agree with that. OK, do you have any other comments, Debbie? Yeah, I agree that I think we, we need to change the code so that we do have the right to have the conversation that you about reforestation. I think in some cases we have to do it. Like it sounds like what Robin did, you know, that made a lot of sense. You know, I've just personally taken down a tree too um, that was dead. And I don't know that, you know, my husband and I are talking about it. I don't think we should put up another tree because I think it's it's in a, it's just a bad place because of, of where, it, where it is so close to my house. And so he and I are in conversation on what to do with that now. And even though it was lovely to have a tree there, but I don't think it, it was, was a good idea when we first put it in. So I, I just think it should be, you know, we should be able to talk about this, but yes, we should be able to mandate that we have a reforestation plan of some sort. And, and then Mr. Tenant Attorney, would you want to put in there that the decision is do you want to give people the right of due process they could they didn't like whatever the staff or the mayor decided it could be appealed to the council or is that not appropriate it would be appropriate mr mayor i, I would say that that's a, a policy decision 
from a legal standpoint, it would be fine either way, with or without the right of appeal. Okay, so that would be up to the U. U that would be up to you, Council. Yeah. Do we want to refer it to PNRC before we review it ourselves, so we get their comments and feedback before we do it? Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion, Robert. Um, and and unless uh, Shannon or Debbie, either of you, uh, disagree, I'll I just. We'll just make this the action for Robin to disc to um, discuss the PNRC. Okay, I will hold off then. All right. So, so you want to wait? So you you want to wait until the PNRC makes a recommendation, Councilor Barr? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So this just, just might Sounds be like a good. one month delay. Sounds I think good. They, they have a meeting coming up soon, so I can try to get it on the agenda then. Sounds excellent. Oh, that'd be great. Um, be, be because if we do get the feedback in time, we can still try and roll it into the September council meeting. All right. Okay. All right, then the next item, sorry, let me pull up my agenda again. The beekeeping position. Matt, can you give us the latest status? Yeah, so um, I did, I included a draft RP that I, I put together. Um, I think based on our previous feedback, the, the idea was that we would feel more comfortable. We, we could actually go out to bid and essentially follow our town's procurement policy, even though it doesn't, um, even though it, it doesn't get the, the dollar amount threshold that we don't expect it to. And then we we could either uh, we could either simply appoint somebody as the town beekeeper and have them be covered under the town's insurance or simply reimburse them if they were if they were to have their own insurance but to um, essentially uh, go out go out to bid get some proposals for it and make a selection from an air uh, and so I the scope of the work I essentially took, what the draft um, contract language was that we had talked about previously and, and entered that into the scope of work. And one thing I did add was um, assisting in uh, B, B City USA certification because actually this all came from in part uh, the fact that Barton and I had found that there's a, a B city uh, organization the same way that there's a tree city and that um, mm -hmm. we sort of lead, lead the way with that. And so- Tree and B city, um, way to go, all right. Like exactly, that. exactly. Um, so we can have some, some nice new B city signs uh, throughout town. And, uh, and so, so maybe just one additional administrative um, thing that they could help with would be just making sure we're checking all the boxes there and sort of getting credit and are, are recognized for the work moving forward. But um, in, in practice, what's there is just sort of formalizing uh, an RFP process for um, what we had generally agreed to was the position. Before. And I, I sent this RFP actually to Elizabeth Harris to get some of her feedback on it to see if it doesn't scare away people or if there's some something in there that might um, might need some some tweaking before we go out to the great and i'm just taking a quick look at b city usa website so i'll enjoy looking at that in more detail uh, just to go around uh, the virtual table uh debbie do you have any Except, questions uh, comments uh, two things one is this seems to be a much bigger thing than when we first started out with you know with somebody approached us wanted to you know uh, set up a apiary and now we're, we're we're sending it out to bid so i was surprised by that when, when i read this today um that's number one number two matt in terms of in if we were to reimburse somebody you know for their insurance costs i would just think we we might think about it it will reimburse, reimburse them up to the amount that we would pay if we were doing it. Because, you know, maybe they want to put on other things. I don't know. And maybe it doesn't make sense for us. So I'd like to just keep that in mind. 
terms of what we would reimburse for. That's it. Yeah, I, um, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't mean maybe, maybe that's just a comment. We weren't necessarily asking for feedback. Well, well let, let, let me provide a, a little feedback, and Robin might have some additional information. But, but my understanding is that the Environment Committee did post some sort of a solicitation or reached out to different organizations several years ago to explore interest in, in somebody providing, a, somebody serving as our beekeeper. Um, it's, it's not as though the town just received a, an unsolicited offer. Um, oh, I thought but, that was, sorry. But, 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 as, but as we're looking at it now, we realize, you know, that's all well and good, but we really, we, not, we have a more formal process now to, to, to bring somebody on board and we have a better understanding of the insurance issues. And from my understanding, if we designate this person as a town employee and they're working on town land, um, there is no cost to the town, no additional cost. The person's beekeeping services would be covered by our town insurance policy. So I, I'm not quite sure, Matt, why we would be offering to pay this person's um, yeah, that, that actually, that's that's a good point, and 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 yeah. So our, our insurance covers volunteers for the town, and so the idea, as the council president mentioned, was that if this person was appointed to this position, um, that they would be covered under the town's existing general liability insurance. And actually, one of the questions I, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to Ron and, and to sorry to put you on the spot, Ron, and maybe this is something you have to look up, but I had two questions because I had put I had put on there a copy of certificate of liability insurance, but that may be an optional element if they if they choose not to, but maybe that's a policy decision that. That, that the council should formally um, decide on. And then the second was, if it is just a volunteer, uh, can we also waive the proof of registration to do business in Maryland? So, yeah, the, the answer there is yes. This is set up as a request for a proposal. So as you pointed out in your introduction, it's my understanding this is for someone to propose to provide these services as an independent contractor. So it would be appropriate to ask for a certificate of liability insurance. But as you noted, you do have the option of appointing them as a, you know, a town officer or employee, in which case then you would no longer need the requirements that would apply to an independent contractor, including certificate of liability insurance and proof of registration of their business to operate in the state. So, so maybe, maybe, maybe the uh, how I should tweet this is instead of doing a formal RFP process based on based on what I'm hearing tonight, and I think based on what was talked about before, um, that aligns more closely with that would be to instead do a, a simpler solicitation for volunteer and, and just ask them to do yep. a simple, you know, one page description of, you know, who they are and, and, and essentially agreeing that, yes, I, I, I'd be happy to take care of your bees for you. I have, you know, this, this colony of bees that I can move over there and I can do a, a you know, one, one uh, educational tutorial thing in town. Yeah, I, I think I may sense, Matt, but let's continue going around virtual table. Uh, Robin? Yep, I mean, right, this was a way of um, formalizing the rather uh, loose environment committee request um, that we start a, a, a bee colony in town. And I, I, I think I, I agree with the idea that this person is going to be a volunteer, but will be the official beekeeper, uh, in essence, of the town of Somerset. We can we can give them a, a, a badge to wear that says official bee, beekeeper town of Somerset, so they feel compensated. But um, 
one little thing about as you've written it um, under the scope of work, it's not apiaries, it's beehives. So, so um, apiary is the collective term for a bunch of beehives together making an apiary. So it, it yeah, you've got it. Um, and similarly, under the second bullet, maintenance of the tone apiary, that'll be singular at that point. Okay, thank you. All right, you got it. Thank you, Robin. Sure. Um, Shannon? Oops, sorry. Um, so does, I'm just confused about the insurance. Does, does our town insurance cover if there are any mishaps that go on with the bees? Yes, our, our, our town, our, our general liability insurance would cover the town. The question, the question was, was more, do we want to require additional insurance? Um, most of our other contractors, we require, or most of our contractors, I should say, we require them to carry their own insurance. Right. Partially so that, uh, you know, a resident can seek restitution from both the town and them individually. Um, in this case, I think the, the feedback was move forward with this and we feel comfortable just having it be covered under the town's general liability insurance. Okay, and then, um, and then if, if we have a volunteer beekeeper, um, so, they would bring their own bees. Is that how it works? And then what if they don't want to be a beekeeper anymore for the town of Somerset? You're going to do it then, Shannon. <laughs> I'm sure they would remove their beehives if they no longer wanted to. So they would yeah, take it's part their, of the pilot program. So they would the take their, also their bees say we don't away. Want to they would take the bee, beehives away and go home. Yes, that's what they'd do. <laughs> But yeah, the, the, idea, the idea I think was that we would do a one year pilot program and that, that gives both sides an opportunity to decide is this something we want to continue and the partnership we want to continue with moving forward. And if, if they don't want to, then we could decide whether or not we want to try to find somebody else or, or just scrap it all together. And then what, I mean, so what is the, what, what is the benefit to the volunteer? They just get a place to have their bees. Yeah, I think we're providing them a place, a safe place to keep keep bees. And I think it's sort of a labor of love for a lot of these people that are volunteers. So part of it is just an intrinsic benefit of being able to spread awareness about uh, how pollinators are good for the environment and things like that. Right, and, and bees are going through a massive destruction at the moment, their numbers falling drastically. Um, so they're really motivated for the, for the bees to build out the bee population, which pollinate a lot of our food. And they yeah. Kind of just towards. Okay, that's all I, those are my only questions. Great, thank you, Shannon. Um, Great. So we're hit. We're, but, we're but of course, there remember the everybody. Remember, this is just to get out the proposal. The final agreement you will have to approve. Right. So this is just an interim review. Right. So we could give Matt some some feedback and and guidance. Great. Thank you all. Next item is town hall rental usage and agreement. My friend, I'm putting you on the spot a lot this evening, Matt, but this is also for you. No, no, uh, no we decided to, let, let, let me start and turn it over to Matt. So as you all know, the, we're reopening the town hall fully in September. And part of that is the ability of residents to rent the town hall for events. Now, this will be the first time this will be done since the town hall was beautifully renovated with lots of money spent. So we wanna make sure that we institute policies that will uh, allow for people to rent the town hall, but will also protect the the town hall. And, and so, um, 
as of September, th there are current rules and regulations in place, but they need to be reviewed for the future. And so um, Matt and Linda and I sat down and looked at our incredibly outdated policies. And, and they were a draft has been prepared, which I hope you all have read. So, so the now I'm going to turn it over to Matt to review the, the the draft, and then if the draft is okay with you, then we will we would um, move forward, not not to be placed on the September agenda, but to be uh, distributed to the to the residents for comments, because I think in this topic, a lot of people have a lot of comments. So, so that's the idea. So tonight, Matt will let you know what he's come, what we've come up with. You please add your comments. And also uh, Linda is on vacation this week. She'd wanted to be here um, but she wasn't able to work it out. But there might be some specific questions you have for Linda since she has been the main person uh, uh, administering the program, so to speak. So if you have questions, we will collect them and we will, we will um, get them answered back to you this week or by next week. So with that, I turn it over to Matt and thank Matt and Linda for all their hard work on this. Yeah, so I, I tried to give sort of an a overview of the, the, the real substantive changes. And, and actually, the, the big things are, number one, if we wanted to look at, at the fees and the fee structure. And then number two was thinking about the space that we have and renting the town hall versus the, the grounds of the town hall. And so... Um, as the mayor said, Lin Linda is actually the one that has done the heavy lifting on this. So um, she's uh, she's in Charleston this week, but um, uh, she had looked up some of our neighboring communities and some of the nearby facilities to get get some sense of um, what what an appropriate fee might be and what people might pay. Um, currently, our, it's $50 to rent, to rent the town hall. And what we've done, especially since with COVID, there were concerns about um, in germs and uh, overall cleanliness. We basically decided that we would do a cleaning of the town hall after every after every event and so in addition to just the rental fee we were asking for people to, to pay a non-refundable cleaning fee as well but and uh, let me give you let me give you some of the history of that so first of all uh the first thing that matt said about renting the town hall and the outside we have never had a policy in the past about renting the outside it was only to rent the rules and regulations only applied to the to the room the the auditorium in the town hall and and using the outside was sort of a gray area but we want to make sure that this is specific in these rules secondly so in the past you know the town hall might have been rented friday night saturday and sunday right and so a renter would show up on Sunday morning and the place would be a big mess. And so, and we had no policies and procedures in place because we don't want to rent, we don't, we don't want to, you know, if somebody is renting the town hall, we don't want them to have to clean it up before they use it for an event, you know. So, the, and, and I know this is something that was discussed uh, by the, um, the two uh, former council members, Peel and Zuighauser, who were so instrumental in in um, renovating the town hall in the in the program, and they were very concerned that you know, in terms of the the damage that we do, would be done when when it wasn't cleaned properly. 
So I think this is a really good suggestion that we, th this, this is sort of um, the uh, a standard practice, any place that you rent, that they, that they clean it up for you. So anyway, I'm sorry. It's going to insert. Yeah, no, that, that's a that's a really important point, and one of the things that I think Linda was trying to be conscious of that we're not we're not a rental company, so we're not we're not out to make money. This is this is a service essentially that is provided to the residents, but we want to make sure that we're charging a fee that that does that we're not operating a total loss on it and that does uh, provide for some of the general wear and tear of using the facility. And so the idea was you can either rent the indoor, this space, the town hall, and then when you do that, you get the outdoor space as well. Or you can say, we don't need the, the indoor space. We just want the grounds um, and, and we want access to the parking lot. And so that would be a much, much smaller fee if you wanted to you could set up a tent out there, whatever you decided to do. And so um, there, there's a couple of other elements to the rules and when we would rent it out that um, wanted to, to update it. Uh, one being that we were, we were, restricting rental to town hall residents um, and partner organizations. Um, the current rules that I attached for you have all, all of these different fee schemes. If it's a class that's renting it, or if it's a friend of Somerset that's renting it, if it's a resident who's renting it, if it's for children, it's this much, if it's adults, this much. And instead, just have it be a, a very simple flat fee for, for everybody. Um, there's not different rental costs for different things. Um, and then I also thought that it would be good to specify that weekdays during the workday that we're not renting it out because um, we don't, we don't the, want to. Be it's the seat of town government. So let me give you a little bit of a history here. Um, everyone. So, the so the, for example, the Friendship Height, the village of Friendship Heights has a beautiful facility, and the town of Chevy Chase Village does, and they they rent out their spaces to. I think anybody can can rent it, but the concern historically about our town hall is that we don't want to turn it into that kind of facility because the neighbors that, you know, and, and Councilman Rovac, this applies to you, for example. So the, the, historically the neighbors around the town hall don't want this to be like a bar mitzvah mill so that they have to worry every night and weekend that there's gonna be cars and noise and everything else. So so I think the, the policy has been that if we want to restrict the you know the rental usage of it and and then also historically we have rented it out to the uh friendship height to the coordinating committee on friendship heights and we've rented it to the town of um, um drummond for their annual meeting but i but again i think you want to make sure i mean it's up to you all how you want to do this, but I, but I think you want to. I suggest that you that we do put limits on on um, who can rent it. Okay, Matt, back to you. I guess no, no, the, the only the only thing I would add before you know the the, the council questions or comments is that um, part of the reason too that. That the mayor and Linda and I talk about uh, res restricting it somewhat is because as things open back up, sensibly the town hall would be used by more committees during you know during the days sometimes, but also in the right. evening. We want to make sure that, as the mayor said, it's the center of of the town government, and that um, that 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 primary focus stays. Um, for the space and that we're right. The, 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 during the 
during the workday, the town hall is our government center and we have to make sure the government functions properly. Now, when I first got elected 20 years ago, you know, the the town hall was rented out during the day to for like yoga classes and the like. And a lot of conflict developed between the classes and the staff because constantly there would be inter interruptions and, and and conflicts with the bathroom and everything else. And so, and I think during the time that Rich Charnovich was here, the council decided that there shouldn't be classes during the day and any kind of outside use during the, the work day. So th this is something that, you know, is on the table that I hope you will, you will affirm that policy. Okay, I'm sorry, back to you, Matt. No, I, that's, uh, that, uh, thank you for making those points. I, I don't think I have anything else to add at this point. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll just say is, you know, one of the things we, we talked about too is there's, there's a few just sort of silly provisions in there that are frivolous that, that can be taken out, like a uh, description of where cleaning supplies are kept in the town hall and um, some rule about the allowable ratio of children to adults. And so uh, can, can do some sort of trim, uh, cut, tr trim the bat or tr whatever the expression is, cut the chaff. Because, because for for the, the real minutia of the rental, Linda and Matt are going to write some instructions. You know, like who to call, there's a problem, that kind of stuff. That doesn't have to be in the rules, the policies that you approve. Uh, and uh, I guess the, the only other thing that, uh, just correcting what I wrote in my write-up for the council is, um, like after I've written this, the mayor had, the, the good idea that uh, town residents might want to have a say in this so that we are transparent about the change in the people. And so rather than put it on the September council agenda without uh, an opportunity for feedback that we can uh, sort of advertise it. But other than that, uh, yeah, I'm happy, happy to answer any questions or take comments or what have you. I'm sorry, I lost track of who's already spoken on this. So um, if there's anybody else has any questions or comments, please speak up. Well, I think that we should, um, you know, I, I think that it makes sense to keep it to residents. And um, I think that it also makes sense to set limits in terms of how many rentals we do. Um, and then, you know, kind of what, what they're used for, because I mean, it can become a full-time job to organize, like even from a town's perspective, like from Matt's perspective and Linda, like to try to organize, um, you know, and keep track of who's renting what and the payments and the this and the that. I mean, it's a lot of, it's a lot of added responsibility, you know, on already a lot of responsibilities that they have um, for their day to day. So I would recommend trying to keep it like pretty minimal and um, and simple, and then definitely a clean fee for sure. Um, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, and and you might want to put in the policy that the that the staff shall not rent it out more than X number of times a month. That's something you mm -hmm. might want to consider. Yeah, because I mean, you know, again, like, you know, we're, like you guys said, we're not like here to make money. Um, and so therefore, um, you know, if, if we're not trying to get a profit by doing you know, all these rentals and stuff like that, then I, to me, it just makes sense for it to be a special perk. If you live in the neighborhood, then you're able to, um, you know, use it if you so desire for a small fee and cleaning fee and, you know, that's it. Well, related to that, one of the issues is, so if, um, I think it says in there now that as the renter, you're supposed to be at the event. Mm -hmm. 
but and so to stay there the whole time, I think isn't doesn't say that Matt. So so the issue is, let's say cancer and row back, your your sister wants to have a, a baby naming party at the town hall, and you you can't be there, but you want her to have that opportunity. Do we want to require that you be there, even if you're if you if you're if you can't be there? I, I don't know. Yeah, you know, that, because I mean, to me, in that scenario, my sister shouldn't be hosting like a party there because she doesn't live in the neighborhood. And okay. if I was the one that was hosting the party, I would be expected to be there. Okay. Well, I, jump- that's, I just wanted to bring that up so that you all dis- discuss it. I want to jump in here. I have seen that abuse at the pool and uh, where, you know, somebody creates a party and it's for their you know, it's for somebody else in their life. They're, they have no intention of, of staying. I, and it was like, I, someone told me they rented it for their manicurist to have a birthday party for their child. And she was on her way out the door. I said, you know what? You can't do that. You got to stay. It's your party. So I, I really think we have to be careful. If we're really limiting it to Somerset residents, then Somerset resident has to host the party. I think bottom line. Well, and at, there was a party at the pool where a kid had to be saved and it wasn't a resident's child, you know? And so, I mean, that just goes to show that, you know, we do have to have um, proper accountability for the events. Okay. So, so I think, I'm not sure that we had a contract that people signed before, but I would suggest that we have a contract and then it says in the contract for what you're suggesting that you you agree to attend the event, and maybe you need maybe Councilmember Heller needs to uh, introduce some legislation to have that requirement at the pool in the to amend the pool rules next year. Okay, and that there be some kind of that if you're going to have a party that you have to sign up and sign sign something that you pledge to follow the rules, and that that's one of the rules. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, I think we can write something very similar. That's for the town hall as well as the pool. We can uh, do something. Um, so so um, we're saying weekends and evenings only. Is that right? Is that the choice? Um, that's fine. And $150 cleanup. I did notice in the rental agreement you posted that the charge for five hours was $200, not $50. I, that's that's what it is in 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 that document, um, and that might be a good thing because trying to explain to people that we're bringing the charge up from two hundred to three hundred is probably easier than explaining to people that we're bringing the charge up from fifty dollars to three hundred. So if it was two hundred, we're probably in better shape committing residents. It's a good thing to do to raise raise it. So okay, I'll stop there. I have something else um, on on renting the outside. Two things. One is I'd like to see the, the, a time limit on the outside, considering we have neighbors. You know, uh, there are neighbors that back up to the, the outside and we have across the street neighbors and um, that, that this really be, it can't be a party till 10 o'clock at night. That's not fair. Is this a party till eight o'clock? Is it seven o'clock? I don't know. I think maybe that's a little bit of a debate. But, but I, and also if they're, if they're only renting the outside for, you know, a cheaper fee or whatever, I mean, I don't know where people would go to the bathroom. I, bathroom, that was my next. This was the, to where? me, like they would go inside, which means that they should have a clean fee anyway, you know, unless they're bringing their own like porta potties, which, you know, adds a whole nother element to it as well. And what that, about that, that? That was part of the, that was one thing that we were working through. And that was a, sort of what Linda and I were thinking is, yeah, if you rent the outside, you don't get a key. So you're you're locked out of the town hall. You don't have access to the bathroom because otherwise, you know, to your point, it can be sort of abused if you're, you know, then people- Yeah, I mean, to- as a neighbor that lives on the street, I would rather have people then have, be able to access the town hall and pay an extra cleaning fee than bringing in porta potties. Also, well, what about what, so I, I'm sorry, Councilor Heller. So, um, as you continue this discussion, I think that y- you need to decide what you want to change in the draft before it before the draft is actually 
um, publicized. Okay. So all these suggestions you're making, you the the four of you should decide which ones you want to put in the draft now. Can I just add one more then? One more so, so the, using the outside. I'll let the council president uh, lead that amendment stuff. So. One, one, one last thing, and that is on the outside, can you use electricity? Can you have, you know, music? Uh, you know, what kind of amplification can you have outside? So anyway, that's my last thing. Um, to the extent that this, this whole topic deals with revenue and cost to the town, do we want to have our revenue committee look at it? I, I guess I personally don't want to debate all the different minutia of what we do and don't want in a town hall rental agreement. Well, it, it's, it's not a way of raising revenue for the town. It yeah. isn't. It's actually just to allow residents use of the town facilities is what it comes down to. We just don't want to make a loss on residents using the town facilities. So I don't think the revenue committee is appropriate. Yeah. Um, okay. okay, that's fine. Send it to them, they're going to figure out how to monetize it and make more money. And I don't think that's our goal. As, as that's completely fine. But then, Rules. Well, it, it's it's identify some council member who can work with Matt to come up with a. Well, I think uh, that I, I think that you you I think that you've identified three or four changes that you all agree can be put in the draft. Remember, once it's just important to get the draft out there so you get comments, and then when you actually vote on it, you can amend it. But I, but I don't. I don't think it really needs any more delay. I think you've all read it and you've come up with some great suggestions. And if three of you agree to those suggestions, put them in there and then we'll put it in the in the journal and then we'll and then it can be introduced not till October anyway. So it's it can be or it can be okay. introduced. It could be introduced on on in on September or that's whatever that's you want. It's up to you. What I I was sort of wondering if maybe that might be a good good way to handle it. I could I could I could put together a, a, a new draft that incorporates some of the feedback from this evening. Uh, introduce it in September. Normally, a, a policy like this can just be adopted in, in one one night, but instead we introduce it. Then we can write a journal article about it and wait to adopt a vote for adoption in October. Based on some of the feedback that we get from town residents. Okay, hey, that that sounds good. Okay, great. Uh, then the last item is building stormwater code revisions. Would you like me to discuss that, Mr. President? Yes, please. Sure. So, at the July eighteen meeting, we discussed potential edits to the stormwater drainage provisions in the code. As you will all recall, currently the code requires a plan for the storage of runoff from rooftop services for a one-year storm event. The term storage we found was unclear in its enforcement. And instead, we talked about having that requirement be on-site infiltration and then the committee recommended a tiered approach for what sort of practices are implemented to achieve that on-site infiltration, starting with conservation landscaping before you can go to structural practices. And then if neither of those are possible, then to storage devices that discharge over time. I've you know, included those edits Councilmember Barr will, will probably have some some comments on whether you know, that needs to be tweaked based on a model ordinance from the Maryland Department of Environment that he shared with me. Uh, other than that, the the draft language would do some cleanup and technical correction. There's some provisions in there that would codify current interpretations, and one that 
Council Member Kumar has suggested that we codify the requirement for a wall check survey, which is routinely added as a condition when the building permits are approved by motion by the council. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you for that concise summary. Um, we'll just go around. Uh, Debbie? Oh, um, you know, I don't have any particular questions for that. I just read through the whole code and had a host of questions about it. But if that's not appropriate for now, that's fine. Um, you know, I, I, but I don't have any specific questions to what Ron just said. Well, let's go around, then we'll co probably come back to you, Debbie. Shannon? Um, yeah, I don't really have any questions. Okay, Robin? Chris Warron, thank you for, for doing this. It's, it's, you've, you've made a lot of progress with this, and I, I do really appreciate that. Why I sent you that, that model ordinance was because the you used the term conservation landscaping and that leapt out at me as it's problematic. Um, and it is, conservation landscaping is one strategy of environmental site design, but it's one of many strategies. Um, others are things like rain gardens and swales and bioswales and all those, all those wonderful things. Um, so, the, the definition and the structure has to be around environmental site design, not around conservation landscaping. That's that's the critical thing. Um, and there is a definition of environmental site design in the ordinance that I sent you, so you can use that ordinance to get the environmental site design definition. Um, there's some other things about the model ordinance. Uh, if reading it, along with the design manual, it allows me to understand very well why the county is where it is right now and why, why the county is doing what it is, uh, what it's doing. Um, I don't think they're doing it well, that's um, separate. But critically in this model ordinance, it says that when municipalities have local flooding problems, then they can go beyond the rules set up in the ordinance. We have local flooding problems. So we really can go beyond what is the outline in that ordinance. The ordinance itself is very compatible with the way we're organizing things. It says environmental site design is the first thing you do and you must do that and exhaust all possibilities to the maximum extent possible before you consider structural. And that's kind of the way we are doing it. That is exactly the way we're doing it. So we, we're very consistent with that, but we're not writing a, a, a stormwater ordinance. We're, we're modifying our, our building code to, for stormwater considerations. And Ron pointed that out to me. So we're not actually going the full hog on it. It is guidance to us though, uh, along a number of ways. And I had also some specific comments further on down the line, I'll, but I'll stop there first. Um, sorry, so I, I'm not quite sure, Ron, can you clarify where you are in your discussions with, with Ron? Is, is he ready to, to incorporate your feedback or is he looking for the council to provide further direction at this time? Well, I, I think critically, um, Conservation landscaping needs to go, at least in the way that Ron's written it, and it needs to be replaced by environmental site design, because that's, that is the, um, it was a 2007 law actually passed in Maryland, which required uh, environmental site design to be the primary means of mitigating stormwater damage, and to that, all that be exhausted before you consider structure beyond that. And so that's, that it really okay. is the law, that concept. So, Ron, are, does that make sense to you? Do you have any issues with making that sort of a change? No, no, I, I think that's easy enough. We can you know, substitute the definition of conservation landscaping for you know, environmental site design and then and define what that means. Councilman Bars also pointed out that Maryland Department of Environment considers dry wells 
to be ESD. Yeah, but we don't not. think we have. I don't think we have to do that ourselves. Um, it just was a curiosity that they do that. I consider them to be structures. They sure look like structures to me, but it's by the by. And and yeah, I mean, I can certainly pr produce a different draft. I mean, fundamentally, I, I have one question that maybe Council Member Barr would would be able to address. Part of the reason we're going through this exercise is because we found the county's implementation of ESD to the MEP to be unsatisfactory. And I, I am somewhat concerned that if we're going to be adopting the same sort of standards, that you know, we could be in the situation of a you know, battle of experts between us and the county. Maybe not a battle per se, but at least from the applicant's perspective. I can hear an applicant saying, the county's telling us we've achieved ESD to the MEP and you know Somerset isn't, which is fine if we have our own independent standards. But I, I am concerned about you know adopting the the same standards as the county with a, you know, potentially a different interpretation. Right. Um, the, the answer is that we're not adopting the same standard as the right. county. Right. What 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 is critical here is that um, the county takes into account the quality of the soil in the town. And that comes from the Maryland design manual where there's um, higher standards if the soil is top quality and lower standards if the soil is of lower quality. So the county ends up saying that we have poor soil generally and therefore holds people to about a, a much lower standard. What we're saying, because we have local flooding, serious local flooding as demonstrated in a survey of residents and also as demonstrated by the WSSC requirement to repair the sewage in Little Falls Creek, we need stricter standards. And so what we've created is a one-year storm standard regardless of the soil. So in other words, that is different from the county. And we are holding them to a higher standard because of that. Um, that's well, sure, but but what if we are applying the methodology of the Maryland Design Manual? And what if the Maryland Design Manual, you know, according to some engineers, doesn't require or results in a waiver from ESD to MEP based on the soil? How how should we? The, 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 the manual and the um, ordinance are quite clear that these are minimum minimum standards that they're putting in there and that local considerations can have higher standards because of local flooding, basically. Sure. So, no, no, no. We're on the same page there. I guess what I'm getting at is we need to specify those standards because right now we're saying you know, implement conservation landscaping or implement ESD to the maximum extent possible under the design manual. Well, so one of the things that like I, Montgomery County would probably also say is that, you know, they seem to be very concerned about the quality, but not necessarily the quantity. And so the quantity is you know, probably more arguably like our bigger issue in terms of our local flooding that we see in our town. And um, I mean, I'm sure the quality is bad too, but I can only speak for the quantity part of it all, which is what the big factor is, you know, with flooding. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. They, they just, they, they told me they really are only concerned with quality. Yeah, and I agree with you there. Let me let me try phrasing it one more way. So we have a substantive criteria being proposed, on-site infiltration for the one-year storm event. But then we're, we would ask applicants to achieve that through ESD to the MEP. And that's where I'm afraid the breakdown is because then they turn to the design manual and say, okay, in order to accomplish this on-site infiltration, I need to use these methodologies, but certain of these methodologies aren't going to be available to me as determined by the county because of my soil or the slope of my grade, et cetera. 
but maybe I'm missing something there. Right. So where do they go after that? Because like, you know, they're going to come back to us and they're going to say, well, I can't put in a drywall because I've already, I don't have enough room for it. And I can't do a permeable driveway because of X, Y, Z and all the things that they would have done for the county's um, code in order to satisfy their code, which is why they would need that, that waiver then. And then, so your point is like, well, what are we supposed to do then with the waiver? Like we can't make someone put in a dry well when there's no room for it. Right. right. Exactly. And then, and then the I'm afraid we, well, you're ending up at tier three in yeah. the draft. But right. That's in the point is that we have three tiers and, and that will cover most cases. In fact, we did our very first case was one of the worst possible cases in town. In fact, okay. um, and so they do environmental site design first, then they go to dry wells basically second, and then they go to rain tank cisterns third is, is the walkthrough. And rain tank cisterns do not require a permeable soil. They can go into clay soil. They are plastic. They, 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 they basically are permanent structures in the soil. Um, so they, they will be the catch all for really it's, it will be an extraordinary site that will not have room for rain tanks, but we do have variances beyond that if we need to have the variance. Okay, yeah, thank you for that explanation. Great discussion. Um, Debbie, do you want to ask some of your questions? No, you know, I realized that, um, you know, a year ago, I didn't really understand all this stuff. And when I read, I read the whole thing, and I had questions, and I don't think they're appropriate for this discussion. I'm gonna start with some of them with Matt. I'll sit down with Matt and ask him some of my questions and come back to when it's appropriate, okay? They're just little okay. things. Thank you though. Okay. Um, yeah, great. I'll bring, I'll bring up one my, my my detailed comment, and I'm, Ron, I'm sorry, uh, the answer is no to your, your, your statement. This is trying to get around the enjoyment issue. And you gave language which says in essence, the uh, whether the proposal work unduly and adversely affects the health and safety of adjoining or confronting property owners and residents or the enjoyment of their property is, is the piece of code that's current. And you say bas basically we'll interpret that as if they comply with the existing town and county code, then that is sufficient for satisfying that term. And in principle, it sounds wonderful, except that we are the judges of whether they comply with the town and town code. And so it puts the onus on us still for deciding whether um, they are satisfying the enjoyment. That's 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 the problem. So as a council member, I'm left with this application that says that um, they have put in a driveway that is not permeable because it's more than five percent slope. Um, and oh, and by the way, it's going to flood the neighbors, but we can't do anything about that. Um, I've got to interpret that still with your code. Can I go back Correct. to enjoyment? When you say enjoyment, I don't know, how, you know, when you build a house that's, you know, like what we had going on on, um, on Uppingham, you know, you drive by and that house being so tall is definitely killed the enjoyment of the people next door. How, how, how do we define that? How do we deal with that? Can we be more specific? If you can't, you know, cut out somebody's light or, you know, you can't, you know, overpower them in some way, you know, how do we handle that? Those issues are typically handled with substantive regulations. For example, a height requirement would obviously, you know, address whether the height of a, a structure is appropriate. Yeah, we may we may want to put in a height requirement. Yeah, but you know, but I mean, to Debbie's point, like even even if even if they're following the height requirements, like you know, there are we have such a unique array of housing in this neighborhood that has different you know features, and so like a lot of the mid-century modern houses that are smaller have skylights and cool windows and no matter what like you know if someone builds a house seven feet away and follows the height restrictions it's still going to block their their views and it's going you know if they're used to having a house that's the same size of them next door 
you know, they probably won't enjoy their space as much anymore because they'll be looking at a white wall like I am. And, you know, so, I mean, I don't have an answer for it, but I understand Debbie, what you're saying. Like, you know, it just, it leaves it open for a lot of interpretation in that, with that enjoyment part, I think. And I think that makes it very hard on us to, you know, uh, to deal with it. You know, I think a great case in point was the house on the Levine's house on Essex, where the house that had they had we given them the permit, they could have built up and and you know t- take taken out their 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 sky their side light, whatever it was, you know. And but we had no jurisdiction to say you can't do that. So one I, option is to delete that provision altogether. I was trying to come up with a, a way to, to save half of it, but you know. Frankly, under Maryland law, as you know, section 2509 of the land use article of the Maryland Code, the town has certain authority with respect to building regulations, and that is to impose setbacks, height limitations, lot coverage, and pervious surface limitations. But among the enumerated authorities there, there's not a you know an enjoyment provision which you might find in the you know, homeowner association for example. Yeah, I mean, there's a house on Drummond, and I'm I'm sure they're following all of the specifications of it, but I guarantee the people next door are not happy with it because it's it's butting up on their property line, and they've never had that there before. So, you know, it's touchy. It probably eliminating enjoyment is the way it will go, but I'll have another look at it myself. Maybe other council members would like to look at it, see if you can come up with another way of saying the same thing. Okay, thank you. Yes, enjoyment is a tough, a tough standard to apply equally and fairly. Um, but that said, it's I like seeing it in our code. It's sort of a visionary statement but i find it hard to apply um any other questions comments on this agenda topic i have one quick question you know on on, on the on the heat pumps on the installation and all of that one of the things it said in there was when you repair a heat pump you need a permit is that so did i read that right i don't think so okay, so yeah i'm sorry council member heller that's not among the edits that I prepared this evening. Right, I, 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 that's I don't why. have the answer off the top of my head, but let me look at the language real quick. I don't, I don't think so. I believe, what we, I believe what we said is if it's in the same location, it does not require a permit. Yeah, that's what we said. But there's something there about repairing your, your heat pump that you needed a permit. I've never heard of that. Okay, so Yes, you're reading from 112-3A, right. which sets forth when a building permit is required. And I did not produce in this draft for you. There's another provision that includes exceptions. And I believe there's an exception for ordinary repairs. Let me look for that. Um. While Ron is looking at that, one one thing I wasn't sure about uh, that we that the council had discussed in previous meetings was uh, the permeable material, uh, permeable driveway requirements, and whether or not we wanted to relax that so that if it is at a certain slope or some of the other extraordinary conditions, that we would also uh, eliminate our requirements. I yeah, I think I ma matching the county standard on that is fine, I think, and that's a 5% grade. So if it's under 5% grade permeable, but if it's over 5%, then it's allowed to be impermeable. Because when you've got more than 5% slope, the even a permeable driveway doesn't capture much water. It's all just running downhill anyway. So. Right. Um, so I, that I, I found the answer, and I'm sorry I missed I missed that discussion. Are we saying that an amendment is required with respect to the driveway 
Yeah, to put in a, a 5% grade rule, um, okay. which is what the county has. Okay. Oh, that, that permeable is not required if the grade is 5% or greater because yeah. everything's going to run off anyway. Gotcha. It runs off anyway, yep. Okay. All right, and then Council Member Heller, Section 112-3B provides no building permit is required for ordinary repairs as defined by the county. And so if, if, if someone's just repairing their HVAC unit, they're not going to need a permit. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Ron, do you clear direction for revising that? Code? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. Thank you all for a great, efficient, effective, productive work session. Thanks, Paul. We're even finishing early. Way to go. <laughs> yes. This is good. Thank you, everybody. Thank have, you a nice, have a nice uh, rest of the summer. Thank and you. we'll see you on September 6th. In person? In, in, in the town hall, right? In the town hall. Sounds right. good. We get to dress up. Right. We're kidding. Okay. Uh, I Bye. Well. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night.